This morning, I would like to speak to you about finding freedom from condemnation and shame. Finding freedom from shame. And the way I'd like us to think about that this morning is by looking at a, in the book of Romans and then looking at what that looks like when it's fleshed out in the life and work of Jesus. All the time asking, what would it look like for me to be free from shame? And what would it look like for me to help others find freedom of sh from shame as well? Because shame is a horrible feeling. Condemnation is a terrible feeling. Um, that was just kind of a thing in our area. Uh, and these wild dogs were also very tame. Uh, so they're quite actually quite playful. Uh, but with lots of wild but tame dogs, what you get is lots of wild but tame puppies. And it's very cute. And they're running uh, all around the place. And one day I arrived at work. And sad story, but there was a puppy that had been clipped by a car. So it was lying uh, in the road with all its wild but tame puppy siblings all around it looking very concerned. And I didn't want uh, uh, something worse to happen. So I thought, I'm going to rescue uh, this little puppy. So I pulled the car over slightly haphazardly, went out, stooped down, and, and lifted up this puppy. Now, just as I did that, what should come around the corner but a minibus full of people, seeing my car slightly haphazardly parked, me with a puppy in my hands, and the look of condemnation, the, the like drive-by jury verdict passed down on me of, of puppy hitter, like uh, guilty as charged uh, was what the looks looked at. And, um, and I, was, I just felt so ashamed. I knew I hadn't done anything wrong. I knew that I was trying to prevent something worse from happening. But as even I talked it over in my head, I even found myself feeling even more guilty as if I was uh, trying to make up something. Uh, and there are lots of things that in life I probably should feel guilty for. Uh, puppy hit and runs is not one of them, fortunately. But the strange thing is, even if you aren't guilty, condemnation will shape you. Shame will try and guide you, even if it has no right to. And one of the promises that we have to receive if we're going to live free from condemnation is this. Romans 8 verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. But this has to be received in order to feel the full of fullness of its impact. Like think about it. Say there's somebody you work with and you think that they're angry with you. If you think they're angry with you, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It will affect the way that you relate to them. It's the same with our Father in heaven. If you think your Father in heaven is angry at you, oh yeah, he forgives you, but he's a bit annoyed about the fact that he had to forgive you. Or, oh yeah, God loves me, but he doesn't really like me. Then that is going to change how you relate to him. And your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. And so understanding that for those who are in Christ Jesus, he will be as pleased to have us there as we will be pleased to be there. Once we understand that he delights in us, that can change everything else. Because if we don't get that, what we end up thinking is that basically life is about how well you do and how hard you try to be good. And that's not life in the spirit. Actually, that's life Focus on the self. That's life focused on the flesh, which we're told leads to death. Here's how Paul says it works. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. Now, there's a lot of words going on in there. Even the first bit feels a little bit like a tongue twister. There is therefore now no condemnation. It's almost like a mouse uh, to loosen you up before you speak. Um, and one of the things to think about is when Paul writes something like this, he's trying to explain what we saw in the life of Jesus. And so one of the ways to enter into this and to understand is to think back to the life of Jesus. And one of the most amazing examples of the truth of this, like fleshed out, if you like, is found in John chapter 8, which is the story that's sometimes known as the woman like when it's lived out. This is John chapter 8, starting at verse 2. At dawn, Jesus appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him. 
and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and he said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, and to go away one at a time. The old ones first until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Amen. At different times, we will find ourselves in different positions, playing the different people in this story. Sometimes I find myself like a member of the crowd, rock in hand, that I want to throw at others. Other times I find myself in the position of those religious leaders with a rock in hand that I would like to throw at Jesus. And other times I find myself like that woman, likely condemning herself with a rock that I've made. And wherever you find yourself in any one of those situations, with a rock you want to throw at others or at God or at yourself, Jesus says the same thing, drop the rock. For there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. The, first of all, the first rock is the rock that you'd like to throw at others. Jesus, to drop that rock, is actually for self-preservation. Because condemnation is a boomerang. When you throw it at other people, it ends up coming back at you. We read this. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. Which, let's be honest, that is weird. That is weird behavior on every level. These people have more issues, I think, than her. They've made her stand there, disheveled, defenseless. But It's a picture of what can sometimes go on in our heads. I don't know about you, but sometimes if I'm upset with someone, I, I, I ruminate on it and I construct this watertight case against them that if I threw at them would leave them absolutely defenseless. Uh, and, And they come and they say, look, we caught her. We caught her in the act. The law says we should stop. And he says, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. In other words, who is qualified to be her judge? And he's got them. He's got them. In my condemnation of other people, I condemn myself. Paul, in the same bit that leads up to this, he said, look, whatever point you pass judgment on other people, you condemn yourself because you do the same. You want to kill her, which is the taking of someone's life. They're both wanting to take what is not theirs. He's got them. But they're worse because they're, they're quoting the law, but last time I checked, it takes two to tango. Where's the guy? Like they brought her, where's the guy? They're claiming the law, but partial justice is an injustice. She's been caught in adultery, but they've been caught with stones in their hands, and condemnation is a boomerang. It, when we throw it out, it comes back at us. So, never be stingy with mercy. Never be stingy with mercy. What this means is drop the rock of condemnation that you'd be tempted to throw at other people. Now, I don't really need to say this to you. I love being part of this church because you spend so much time listening to other people, whether that's on Alpha or at Safe Haven or groups. Love listens. And you do this so well. But it's worth talking about because in our cultural moment, There is a lot of rock throwing going about. And actually, uh, we have never had such a good sling for throwing rocks as social media. Social media is an amazing slingshot. There's a lot of rock throwing going on, but we don't have to join in. We don't have to join in. And actually, for me, social media also allows you to kind of enjoy other people throwing stones at other people, but that's just as bad for my soul, actually. 
Now, what I'm not saying is that we don't hold people to account. Actually, holding people to account through the proper means and proper processes is a way of letting go of the rock because you're sharing the responsibility with others. And we're, we're privileged to live in a country with the rule of law and, and with police. And the way we do it here is through something called safeguarding. And as I've said to you before, I would love it if all of us went through the safeguarding training that we have offered here because it helps us create a safe culture in this place. But the training is amazing and it will help you as a follower of Jesus uh, creates safety where you find yourself. But what this says to us is, yeah, we hold people to account, but if there's no condemnation for me, it also means there's no condemnation that I get to use as ammunition against other people. It's so easy to fill your rocks, pocket with rocks, but actually they weigh you down. And as you throw them at others, so you fling them at others, they hit you in the face. So drop the rock. The rock that we would like to throw at God. Jesus says, drop the rock. Now, that might seem a bit strange. And actually, there's a lot of humor in the Gospel of John. Often it's ironic humor. Here, these people want to accuse Jesus, who is God, and they want to use his law to get him. Like, they're like trying to trap the word of God in his words. It's, it's absolutely ridiculous. We read, they were using this tr question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. There are times, like the religious leaders, that we have accusations that we want to throw at God because we're in pain or we're angry or because people we care for are in pain or uh, have been hurt. And, and actually... I have, I don't know about you, but in my heart, there is a little religious leader that when it feels wronged, likes to accuse God. Now, the religious leaders here, they're upset because they think they've got power. And Jesus is disrupting that power. And so they're like, we need to get him. And for me, it's like when I think that God is infringing on my self-control, I, I try and keep him at arm's length. And through one of the ways is by throwing accusations at him. I kind of think he has to limit my life, and so I try and keep him at arm's length. And, and one of the ways to do that is through these sort of moral dilemma questions. And, and as they go, this is a good one. You know, it's a first century equivalent of like an escape room. Like, see if you can get out of this one, Jesus. And they quote the law, and they quote it accurately, but not fully. And they do it with the wrong motive. See, questions and doubts are not in opposition to faith. The opposite of faith is not doubt. Actually, the opposite of faith is, is, um, is uh, offense. Offense at Jesus that leads to trying to condemn Jesus. But actually, it doesn't work to try and be God's judge because he doesn't invite us to come that way. Jesus doesn't say, come to me as my judge. He says, come to me as my stops the conversation. Condemnation stops the conversation. It's hard to be friends with someone that you can't talk to. And when God says, drop the rock that you want to throw at me, it's instead of throwing it at him, it's bringing it to him. It's to say, God, I have this pain. I have this hurt. I have this thing that wants to become a fence in my heart. And I bring it to you and I want to talk to you about it. There is nothing that goes through your heart before him and say, God, I want to talk about this. We get to bring it all. Now, the surprising thing about this story for us as 21st century Western readers is probably not, we're not probably surprised that the woman isn't condemned because we've been shaped as a culture by like 1,500 years of the teaching of Jesus. Our culture has this momentum towards caring for the powerless and we bend towards permissiveness, especially in this area of morals and morality. The real surprise probably for us is that Jesus doesn't condemn the condemners. Like, the way it often works is somebody does something wrong, people pile in and criticize them, usually on social media, and then a load of others pile in and criticize the criticizers. They fight fire with fire. And Jesus doesn't do that. Look, at it. it's so interesting in verse 9. He doesn't condemn the condemners, but he does convict them. We read, at this time, those who began to, those, he speaks to them, 
And at this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. You can imagine them sidling off one at a time because you don't announce when you've kind of been convicted and realized something about yourself. The old ones first, because they know there's a lot going on, until only Jesus was left, was convict them. What's the difference? Um, a while uh, back, uh, we were putting our kids to bed and we try and make uh, the nighttime routine as calm as possible. And I changed all the kids' nappies. We put them into bed and we were just tidying up the room. And I was just leaving and Kate just grabbed one of the nappies I'd, I'd just changed and she tossed it to me uh, to put into the nappy bin. Only I hadn't taped up the nappy. And so as she threw it to me, it sort of unfurled like this horrific kind of flower and ejected its contents uh, all across the room, all across the carts, all across me. And it went from this moment of being like, ah, oh, lullaby baby, to ah, oh, it's everywhere. Now in that moment, with it all over my shirt, condemnation would say, this, and never speak of it again. That's condemnation. Conviction says, this shirt needs a wash. Conviction also says, Dan, tape up the nappies. But condemnation is shame about the past. But conviction gives us a direction and a hope towards the future. Jesus calls her sin, sin. He's clear, but not to condemn, but to convict her so that she might be free from this life that is destroying her and those around her. When Jesus calls something sin, it's because it's harmful to us. It's stealing our joy. You know, we are not more pastoral or caring or kind, kinder than Jesus. He speaks into this stuff because he wants us to be free from it and he gives us direction to turn around. The thrust of repentance is not shame about the past, but it's an invitation into the future that he has. It's all encompassing. It says you are no good, you never were any good, and you'll never be any good, which is a lie. Conviction says, you know, condemnation is just like this gray cloud that just takes everything. Whereas conviction is like a surgeon's knife precise and deals with it so we can be healed. See, the amazing thing is, the power behind all of this is that God has dropped the rock that he could have thrown at us. Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus has every right to condemn us, but instead he chooses to be condemned in our place. He chooses to go to the cross in our place. The, the crowd here, they catch this woman in her sin to catch her out. But Jesus, when he catches us in our sin, it's to break our fall. He catches us to set us free. They catch to stone, he catches to save. God has dropped the rock that he could have thrown at us. He has dropped that rock. And what that means is that if God has dropped the rock that he could have thrown at us, we should drop the rock. Actually, in fact, there's no rocks left to throw. As you go through the flow of this story, at the start, it looks like the woman is going to be condemned. And then it looks like Jesus is going to be condemned. Then it looks like the crowd is going to be condemned. And at every point, Jesus dismantles the condemnation and responds with mercy. There is more mercy in him than there is sin in me. And so he just keeps giving and giving. Where are your accusers? And the ones who would condemn her couldn't. And the one who could condemn her wouldn't. Jesus asks her, and he asks you, where are your accusers? And for many of us, the answer is, here, me. I'm accusing myself. Now, there are some reasons that we do this. One is we're trying to change our behavior. We think, you know, a little bit of shame, a little bit of condemnation will keep our behavior in track. But actually, condemnation doesn't change us. You know, a good rule of thumb is never speak to yourself in a way that you wouldn't speak to your friends. An even better rule is never speak to yourself in a way that Jesus doesn't speak to you. He is so kind. He is so merciful. We're told it's his kindness that leads to repentance. Nation doesn't work, which is why he doesn't use it. What will work? What works is knowing that you have an advocate in heaven.
that every time something goes wrong, every time we choose to do something wrong, Jesus turns to his Father in heaven and says, I've got this covered. I will deal with this. And when you see that love, the love that took Jesus to the cross in my place, that's the kind of love that changes our heart. And because of that, and actually what this story says is, that's beside the point. This woman is, is complicated. She's, there's obviously things going on that have caused her to act like this, but she's chosen to act like this. There's all these different things going on. And this is exactly the kind of person that Jesus chooses to lay his life down for. If you're a complicated person, I know I'm a complicated person, Jesus lays his life down for you. And John has this little play of words here, because the word for court means to apprehend, but it also means to comprehend. They want to apprehend her in her sin, but Jesus comprehends us in our sin, and he knows what we need. He knows everything about us, and he loves us. Jesus dealt with everything that we have done, and so what it means is all there is left for us is grace. Now, the last reason that people is this challenge that we all still struggle. And it's worth highlighting. It doesn't say there is therefore now no consequences for those in Christ Jesus. Like if you, I don't know, if you, if you kick a dog, Jesus won't condemn you, but the dog still may bite you. Uh, there are consequences. Um, although sometimes even in God's grace, he, he, he ministers into those consequences and he always uses them for our good. But the reason does, Paul says this, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. The law of the spirit of life. What does that mean? Well, you could think of it a bit like gravity. The law of gravity is working on all of us at this moment. It's why those stones fell. It's why that you don't float out of your chair at this moment. But when you want to go on holiday and you get into a plane and it flies away, it's not that the law of gravity no longer is at work on you. It's that the law of aerodynamics has started acting on you. Like it's not that the law of gravity has stopped. It's the law of aerodynamics has started. And so you fly it's not that the law of sin and death has stopped working on us. We still feel the tension. We still feel the law of Jesus' love and grace is on you and is at work on you. And it means when you feel tempted, when you feel challenged, you can know there is no condemnation because Jesus loves us. Now, obviously, there are times where I think, well, of course Jesus would love that person over there. Of course Jesus would love you. You're amazing. You're lovely. You're kind. Well, kind of like back to the plane analogy. Like, Well, of course they fly. They're a, a fighter jet. Whereas I'm is at work on you. There is a greater law at work in our lives now. And here's the really cool thing about that analogy. Like, Engineers, aeronautical engineers, mathematicians know how to design planes so that they fly, but they can't fully explain why they fly. There is no full scientific consensus on how these competing theories work and how the forces come together. Actually, there's two different theories. They're both incomplete, both slightly incompatible. But you know what? That doesn't stop us going on holiday. Like, we might not understand the equations, but we get in the plane and it flies. And because this is something that Jesus works on you, it means you don't have to fully understand it in order to receive it and in order to walk in it, because we live by faith. And it looks like what this woman experienced. You know, the woman experienced, along with the man, to be condemned, but the law of Jesus' forgiveness was working on her and was more powerful and saved her from death and opened up to her a new way of life. And he wants to do the same for you. And do you know what? It is amazing to see. It's so wonderful to watch. Uh, a few years back, my friend Dan uh, came on Alpha and uh, we asked him after uh, he bankrupt, I would wake up in the morning and I would condemn myself. I would look in the mirror, say vulgar things to myself and curse myself for the mistakes I made and the impact it had on my family. Every day, for 10 years. And he then encountered Jesus. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He got baptized and he said, two weeks later after his baptism, I was brushing my teeth at the mirror and suddenly I realized, hey, I don't condemn myself anymore. He'd stopped and actually at first he hadn't even realized because it'd been taken away. 
it was wonderful to see that change in him. It's even more wonderful as you experience it for yourself. Jesus has done it for me. He's done it for my friend Dan, and he wants to do it for you too. He invites us to drop the rock.